here. So our first speaker is on the east west coast, a uh, Corinne Lee, water drinking man, uh, water manage, uh, program manager for EPA Region Nine Pacific Southwest. Uh, just reading off of her bio here, uh, she manages an, an office responsible for oversight of drinking water programs in the U.S. EPA Region Nine Pacific Southwest region. In her capacity, she works on works on national policies and directs regional resources to assure the delivery of safe drinking water. Her office is responsible for overseeing authorized drinking water programs in Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, Navajo Nation, and other Pacific Islands of American Samoa, CNMI, and Guam. So she's right here in Region 9, right in our region. Um, she also works closely with the Region 9 office responsible for water systems in the 148 federally recognized Native American tribes to ensure compliance with the safe drinking water regulations. She's the management lead for Region 9 emergency response team for providing assistance to states, tribes, and utilities. She's also a registered professional civil engineer in the state of California, and she's been with Region 9 for 30 years. So a lot of experience. We're very fortunate to have her on. So Karina, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Again, any questions, please put it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, I'm hoping that you can hear me and I see my um, slides are up and I understand that um, Joe will be working my slides for me and ensuring that you all hear good, clear audio and video. I am going to actually turn my video off um, and I'm going to get started. So uh, next slide, please. So I to start off, I think it's very important, particularly um, at this time, to talk about our regulatory flow in, um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, because it will be key as we go through the rest of my presentation, and it will hit upon a number of these bucketed areas that you see on this slide. Um, our, our first area that we start off with is our contaminant ca candidate list, and it's the primary mechanism for like identifying contaminants that require regulation. So every five years, EPA defines a new uh, listing of candidates on this list for, of unregulated contaminants that are known to occur in drinking water. Um, we are in the midst of developing our fifth contaminant candidate list. In October of 2018, the agency requested nominations by uh, our industry stakeholders of, of chemicals, microbes, and other materials for consideration. The, con the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, which follows, provides EPA with the data that we determine if a contaminant occurs at a frequency and at levels of public concern. The data that is generated from UCMR then is then used for our regulatory determination actions. And that's, that's when the agency works toward informing whether or not we move forward to regulate a contaminant or not. And then if a positive determination is made, EPA has 24 months to propose a rule and then 18 months to put out a final rule. The Safe Drinking Water Act also requires the agency to review our national primary drinking water rulemakings every six years to determine if there are opportunities to further protect public health. And what I'm going to be covering over the next um, half hour or so well, is on the right is our updates. We'll talk about UCMR 5, Reg Debt 4, kind of where we are with perchlorate, spend quite a bit of time on the most recent release lead and copper rule revisions touch upon six year review and consumer confidence report. Next slide, please. So section 1445 of the Safe Drinking Water provides us the authority to require water utilities to collect uh, water samples for unregulated contaminants for possible future rulemaking. The list that we put out should contain no more than 30. It's issued every five years. Um, and it, it currently is targeted at systems serving a population greater than 10,000 persons, but it also includes a 
represent a subset of smaller utilities, less than 10,000 for which they would monitor. EPA stores this information into what we call the National Contaminant and Current Database. Um, and we are currently finishing up UCMR cycle four, where we put out 10 cyanotoxins in addition to other chemicals. Uh, we had put that rule out in October of 2016, and we are wrapping up that monitoring, which um, the final result should be into our database by the end of 2021, but the monitoring should have occurred between 2018 and 2020. On, and, and this is kind of news breaking, on January 19th, just, just the other day, we announced our proposed UCMR5. Um, the UCMR5 proposal includes monitoring for 29 perfluorinate, perfluorinated compounds known as PFAS compounds. It also includes those six PFAS compounds that were part of UCMR3 monitoring, and it includes the contaminant lithium. The proposal would require monitoring by water utilities between 20 and 2023 and 2025, with final results reported no later than 2026. Um, I will say something that's noteworthy here, though, is under the UCMR5 proposal, is the lowering of the population threshold to include systems that serve greater than 3,300, which um, were not included into the universe of UCR monitoring of the past. Next slide, please. Moving forward, and as you remember from that process flow, from the UCMR database data set, EPA makes regulatory determinations. And these regulatory determinations um, have criteria, and that's what here is on the slide. So every five years, and, and there's a theme, it's a five-year cycle from the contaminant catalyst, unregulated contaminant monitoring, and every five years we do a regulatory determination based on what we see and what we find. The criteria that we use um, is, one, the contaminant may have an adverse effect on the health of persons, it's known to occur or, is, or there is substantial likelihood that this contaminant will occur in public water systems at a frequency and at a level of concern. And then thirdly, in the sole judgment of the administrator that regulating this contaminant would present a meaningful opportunity to, for health risk reduction. Next slide. So where are we? Um, we are in cycle four, and on February 20th, EPA put out a, a rulemaking proposing to regulate two chemicals, PFOA and PFOS, and not to regulate six others. Um, we are, we will, we announced, and I think it was just the other day, that we have moved forward on um, a final determination that will regulate PFO and PFOS and not to regulate these six other chemicals. Um, it is not yet published in the Federal Register, but the agency has announced it and it is up on our website. So just briefly, next slide, P perchlorinated compounds or perfluorinated compounds, PFAS, man-made chemicals from the 1940s that are not naturally found in our environment. The strong carbon fluoride bond in these um, six carbon chained chemicals makes them extremely persistent in the environment and resistant to typical environmental degradation. Perfluorooctanoic acid and perfluorooctane sulfate are the two most extensively produced and studied. Where are they found? Or they are used in a variety of, in, next slide. They are used in a variety of industrial and consumer products because it has a very unique ability to repel oil and water. It supports its, its valuable usage on surface protection products like food packaging in your pizza boxes and in your popcorn 
microwave packages. They're used in sealants. They're used to treat fabric like your carpet and your um, jackets, your rain jackets and your camping tents. They are uh, used in stain repellents. They are industrial surfactants and emulsifiers and wetting agents and additives and coatings. And of particular note, they are used in firefighting foam because of its surfactant ability to lower the surface tension between you know, uh, air and, and, and liquid. Um, and so AFFS, aqueous film foaming, forming foam, AFFF is what you hear a lot around contaminated water supplies due to a triple foam use in and around the area and it is comprised of both PFO and PFOS. Where do you find it? Really, it's released directly into the environment through processing by industrial manufacturers with direct releases to the air, water, soil, and in and around the manufacturing facilities. Indirectly released through disposal of PFAS containing products and it has also been found in products that are where you would have your use PFAS products to manufacture other products, so other secondary manufacturing facilities. Well, next slide. Why is it a concern? Um, because of its widespread use and environmental persistent, most people have been exposed to PFAS chemicals. It's a possible carcinogen. It's readily absorbed after oral ingestion and it accumulates in your body, in your blood serum, in your kidney, in your liver. And there's evidence that suggests PFO and PFOS may cause cancer and have adverse reproductive developmental and immunological effects. Next slide. Um, so as, as a result of increased awareness of PFAS in the environment, um, the, as a result of our 2018 PFAS National Leadership Summit, we put forth a 2019 PFAS action plan. The very first kind of multimedia, multi-program national research management and risk plan to reduce PFAS in the environment and to minimize risk. Um, and it, it, its intent was to provide tools to regulatory agencies and utilities to deal with the challenges associated with this emerging contaminant category known as PFAS. In terms of water, um, so some background, you know, the, the whole UCMR3, where we had required utilities serving greater than 10,000 to monitor for six unregulated PFAS compounds, really daylighted the PFAS contamination in water supply. Um, there were six PFAS compounds, um, and in 2016, EPA lowered the health advisory for PFOA from 400 parts per trillion and PFOS from 200 parts per trillion to a lifetime health advisory of 70 for PFOA and PFOS, either as in, an individual or as contaminants combined. That coupled with enhanced advanced um, changes to and improvements to our analytical methodology is now saying that we can now detect PFO and PFOS and other PFOS compounds with a higher level of degree and frequency. So when we put out UCMR3, back then we were using method 537 that allowed for us to be able to analyze for 14 perfluorinated compounds. We revised that method in 537.1 to now address 18 PFAS compounds. And now we are moving on to method 533 that will address 29 compounds. So again, in December of 2019, we moved forward with that method 533. In November of 2020, we developed an interim permitting strategy for PFAS and released information on new analytical methods to test for PFAS compounds in wastewater and other environmental media. In January of this, uh, uh, in this month, this past month, we announced our final determinations to move forward on PFO and PFOS for regulations and a proposal to require monitoring for 29 PFAS um, in drinking water under UCMR5. And then in January of 2021, 
we finalized our effluent guidelines program plan that speaks to collecting data and information regarding PFAS manufacturers to really inform whether these industrial sources warrant regulations to address PFAS dischargers. Next slide, please. In the area of cleanup, we're working on a proposed rule to designate PFO and PFOS under CERCLA as hazardous substances. Um, and in doing so, it would provide the agency with added authority to, to require responsible parties to carry out cleanups, to seek recovery of cleanup costs from those responsible parties, and to enhance an ability to hold such re responsible parties accountable. In December of 2019, EPA issued interim recommendations for groundwater contamination which provides guidance for federal cleanup programs, such as those under CERCLA and under RICRA. It provides a starting point for site-specific cleanup decisions and uh, provides assistance and will better inform communities across the country that are challenged with addressing their drinking water sources. It recommends a screening level of 40 the, um, to, de to determine if levels of contamination warrant added investigation, and it recommends using um, our health advisory of 70 as preliminary remediation goes, goals. Once these recommendations are final, it provides a starting point for site-specific cleanup decisions, um, federal facility and private party cleanup dialogue under CERCLA and RECRA and state cleanup programs where, where it's appropriate. And then in December of 2020, we issued interim guidance on destruction and disposal of PFAS and materials containing PFAS. Under our toxics release in uh, program, there is called the toxics release inventory that tracks the management of toxic chemicals that may pose a threat to human health. So this TRI provides information about listed toxic releases and related pollution prevention activities by industrial and federal facilities through annual reporting by those facilities. And in June, we move forward um, a, a final regulation that added 172 PFAS chemicals to the TRI for reporting. In July of 2020, we also move forward with a final regulation that, um, that prevents products containing PFAS from entering or re-entering the marketplace without explicit EPA permission. Next slide, please. Perchlorate. Um, perchlorate, a chemical compound commonly used in solid rocket propellants, munitions, fireworks, uh, let's see what else, um, matches, signal flares, um, you find them at um, a lot of uh, military fields, bases. Um, it occurs naturally. Um, and in the arid Southwest, um, it is also a byproduct in hypochlorite solutions used for water treatment and nitrate salts used in fertilizers and explosives, fertilizer explosives. Um, on June 18th, um, on June 18th, EPA, uh, on June 18th, of, well, let's go to the slide first. The slide shows that back on in 2019, we moved forward. We made a positive determination and we moved forward to, to seek input on whether to regulate the perchlorate standard at 18, at 90, or to withdraw. Um, on June 16th, June 18th of 2020, we withdrew our regulatory determination that we made in 2011 and made a final determination to not pursue a national regulation for perchlorate on the basis that um, between EPA, the states and water utilities that they have taken proactive steps to reduce perchlorate in the environment, um, mostly in California. Um, EPA also did a new health impact analysis based on recommendations from the science advisory board um, that showed that the concentration of perchlorate that may present a public health concern 
is higher than the concentration that we had considered when we made that positive determination in 2011. So based on updated risk data and analysis and the lack and the fact that there's been a significant reduction of perchlorate in water, EPA in June of this past year determined that it was not found in drinking water at a frequency and at a level of public concern to warrant moving forward with a regulation. So we have put that one to bed. Next slide. So um, probably the, the rule that we've been waiting for for quite some time um, is lead and copper rule revisions. And it may not be as, um, as prevalent in terms of lead exposure in water here in the Pacific outer Pacific in the Pacific Southwest region, it is certainly a big thing in um, our nation, mostly in our Eastern seaboard regions and our Eastern seaboard states where there is, continues to be um, a proliferation of existing lead service lines in place. Um, so uh, this, uh, this is merely a, a visual that shows that 30 years after we put in place the initial lead and copper rule, we have made significant revisions and issued um, and announced on January 15th, a final lead and copper rule revision. Um, we've had a number of revi uh, revisions in between, but they were smaller in scope and were, were building upon the initial lead and copper rule that we issued in 1991. So on December 22nd, 2020, EPA issued a pre-publication of the final rulemaking. It is on our website. Um, and my understanding is as of June 15th, it has been published in the Federal Register. Next slide. So some highlights of the lead and copper rule revision. Um, it is, you know, for the first time systems were required to test at schools and childcare facilities addressing goal one to better protect children. Goal two, get the lead out through better science and better testing of targeted sites. And goal three, empower the communities by providing information on where lead service lines exist and how to protect your family. Next slide. Um, the present of lead, um, again, traditionally is not found in the source water. Rather, it really enters your drinking water through corrosion of lead in the service line, in faucets, in fixtures that dissolve lead in the water. Lead is also used in the brass for solder and materials. Um, so this slide shows there's no change to what has been the um, MCLG. It continues to remain at zero because there's no safe level of lead exposure. The lead and rock copper continues to remain as a treatment technique regulation because it's not technologically or economically feasible to establish a value that can be applied um, the treatment unit compels action once you exceed some level. Um, and so the mechanism we use are called action levels. Um, so we retained the 15 parts per billion for lead and the 1300 parts per billion for copper at the 90th percentile. Next slide. What is new though is um, a trigger level. So um, the revisions with regards to the requirements in terms of course treatment are based on sampling results. And currently as the current rule, the current rule does not provide any incentive for water systems to further reduce lead exposure. Um, and, and therein lies this new trigger level. So the agency has put forth a trigger level of 10 parts per billion at the 90th percentile. Systems that exceed the trigger level, but not the action level of 15. So again, lead levels between 10 parts per billion and 15 parts per billion. For those systems that have currently are implementing corrosion cone treatment, they will be required to re-optimize. Systems without corrosion control treatment who exceed the 10 parts per billion trigger level will be required to conduct a study so that they're prepared to respond. Um, and there is also additional factors associated with, um, if you exceed the trigger level, you are, there is no reduced tamp sampling. 
such as the current rule allows for a reduction to triennial. Any, any system that exceeds the trigger level of 10 will be required to sample annually at their standard sites and implement a goal-based lead service line reduction program and provide annual outreach to consumers. Next slide. The TAP sampling criteria for the lead and copper rule revision has changed. It has moved from three tiers to five tiers and it's really targeted at lead service line sites. And it is going to ask utilities to recategorize their copper pipe with lead solders into a different tiering. Um, the 90th percentile calculation uh, for lead, if you are a system with known lead service lines, all of your sample sites are to be 100% from those lead service lines. And, and then it goes down to if you have an insufficient number of lead service of numbers of um, with insufficient number of, of lead service line sites, then you, you, it's a combination of samples from your lead service lines as well as from non-lead service lines, but you, should, you shall be choosing those sites that have the highest lead levels from those non-lead service line sites. And then of course, there's the, the default systems that don't have any lead service lines, then you just use your tap sample, you, you know, the, you just need to identify the minimum number of tap samples that you will be required for your standard monitoring. Um, here is just a, a brief slide um, on the, the now revised sample site tiering. It goes from three tiers to five tiers. Um, the one I call your attention to is a, a tier three, single family residences with galvanized required replacement that are downstream from a lead gooseneck or pigtail. That's new. The you know single family residence with copper um, are now a tier four. Um, and um, water utilities might need to uh, re, they will, will need to re-tier and they will need to, it will all depend on your service line materials inventory as to which tier you would fall in and, and, um, and you may need to readjust depending on what you find and how this rule applies to you with regards to your materials. Um, in terms of tap sampling, um, and again, this first bullet applies only to systems with a lead service line. Yeah, there's going to be a, a requirement for a, a fifth liter to be collected at sites. There will be no more allowance for instructions that calls for the removal or cleaning of aerators and um, or flushing prior to stagnation and systems are required to provide wide mouth bottles to mimic the, uh, the flow of water at a tap that you would normally use. Again, um, as I reiterated, if systems exceed the trigger level, they are required to stay on annual monitoring. You're no longer eligible to reduce to triennial. Systems that are above the action level must monitor every six months with results at or below the action level for two years. I think the old rule was just one year. And then systems that has a source change or a long-term treatment change will need to monitor every six months, likely again for two years um, below the action level before they can go to reduce monitoring. Corrosion control treatment. Uh, mentioned again, systems with OCCT are needed to re-optimize if it exceeds the trigger level. Systems without OCCT would need to complete a study and then uh, a new element of under corrosion control treatment under the revision is that Sanitary surveys will now include a review of a system's corrosion control treatment and their water quality parameter assessment monitoring. Next slide. A new element of the rule also is this so-called find and fix. It requires systems to collect follow-up sampling for each lead tap sampling. And again, just lead, not copper each lead tap sample that exceeds the 15 parts per billion and implement a so-called find and fix approach. And it's really to identify the cause and to try and mitigate that problem, problem to see if it's localized or system-wide. So systems must collect follow-up samples within 30 days of learning of the results. They're required to report the results to the regulatory agencies, but these results are not to be included in your 90th percentile calculations. Systems with 
Corrosion control treatment will be required to collect an additional water quality parameter sample at or near the site where the high lead sample was collected within five days. Systems without corrosion control treatment will be required to collect possibly water quality parameter samples, again, at or near the high lead sample, but within 14 days of learning the results. Systems must determine if a fix is needed. And again, to again, is it localized or is it is there a need for a system-wide corrosion control treatment change? Do you do spot flushing? Do you do um, distribution operational changes? Do you do flushing your distribution system? Do you look at system looping and other strategies to reduce dead ends? Um, if a system identifies a fix that's out of their control, such as it's, you know, as a result of premise plumbing, then they just need to provide that documentation to the regulatory agency. And again, the goal really is to determine if corrosion control treatment is effective and to address unanticipated um, dis, um, deviations in your system. So it's, it's, it's one of those areas where I, I think um, we'll, we'll do much to try and reduce and minimize exposure to lead um, once you are able to localize the problem. The service line inventory. Um, are uh, currently systems were only required to do a one-time materials evaluation. And you only needed to do enough to identify twice the number of sampling sites that you needed to meet your minimum. You were not required to look the entire system, the sites were not made public, and you didn't have to take any action unless you exceeded 10% of your samples because it's at the 90th percentile. Under this new rule, systems will must prepare a initial service line inventory by January 16th of 2024. That is the three years after promulgation. So this is kind. This is one of those asks and requirements of a water utility at the time that the rule is is in effect. Um, the Service line inventory must identify lead service lines, lead, lead status unknowns, galvanized lines, and um, non-lead service lines. Lead connectors are um, like goosenecks and pigtails. They're not required to be in your inventory, but it's highly recommended that you document it and include it where records exist because when water systems are needing to do lead service line, replacement, they also must replace the lead connectors when they're encountered. Um, a location identifier meaning that the water utility and, and will need to make sure that in their line in service line inventory, there needs to be some means of identifying where those service lines are located. Um, you know, it, separate and apart from uh, residences addresses. And then the systems are to update this inventory annually or triennially if the system is on reduced monitoring. Next slide. There is a small system uh, flexibility that's new. It applies to all com small community water systems serving less than 10,000 people and all non-transients. It provides an alternative for corrosion control treatment. Um, so the full service line replacement is still there. Corrosion control treatment is still there, but it provides these latter two. It allows for the installation and maintenance of point of use devices and allows for replacement of all lead bearing plumbing fixtures at every tap where water is used for human consumption. Next slide. Um, notification and public education. Um, again, this the so called service line inventory is supposed to be made public. Um, there needs to be public notification within 24 hours of a 90th percentile action level exceedance. That is new, but it's also part of a statutory. Uh, Act change to the Safe Drinking Water Act under a, the Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act of 2016 required notification within 24 hours to consumers of a 90th percentile exceedance. It's notice um, the notice to customers with individual tap samples greater than 15 parts per billion within three days. Um, you know, annual outreach to consumers when you're you, you have lead service lines and you exceed the trigger level. Um, there is public education that is going to be asked to be provided to consumers when you're doing uh, water related work that may disrupt or disturb your lead service lines. Um, we will be putting out revised health effects information, 
and there needs to be access to from by the public to access tap sample results. Next slide. Um, this is that new provision of now uh, community water systems needing to test um, customers that provide water to schools and licensed child care providers. So if you have service connections that provide water to educational facilities, and again, the focus on school is on elementary schools, um, the, the rule requires the uh, development of an inventory uh, by, uh, I think again, another one of those due three years after promulgation, January 16, 2024, and utilities are to update that inventory and verify it every five years. For the first five years, it's 20% of um, collection, 20% uh, of your elementary schools, 20% of child care facilities. Um, and each child care facility, it's two samples. At each school, it's five samples. After one round of sampling, so after the first five years, um, these elementary schools and care because we could ask for resampling and retesting at their upon request, but there's no requirement to continue it. And then some systems um, can sample upon request if secondary schools seek this as well. There is uh, education that needs to be provided. Um, and EPA has a three T's program to train, test and take approach that is to be provided to these facilities. And then sampling results need to provide to uh, the school to the regulatory agency and to the local health departments on a set time frame, And then this, the community water system would need to provide an annual certification to the regulatory agency that it met its notification and sampling requirements. Whew, that was lead and copper. And that was all as a result of a final rule that just got put out on January the 15th. And today is what, January the 20th. So you are hearing it. Um, uh, kind of in a very, very timely manner. Uh, let's move on to six year review. And this is that last little piece to the right of that um, regulatory process flow where the Safe Drinking Water Act requires EPA to go back and revisit our national rulemaking every six years and to revise if appropriate. Um, and, and again, each revision is to provide greater protection of public health. Um, so let's see, under um, the six year review one, we, we decided that we would move on total coliform rule. And therein lies why we went forward with a revised total coliform rule. In six year review two, we decided to look at acrylamide, epichlorohydrin, tetrachloroethylene, and trichloroethylene. Um, and those were addressed, I think tetrachloroethylene and trichloroethylene has been on pause and we addressed acrylamide and epichlorohydrin in some prior action. And I, I think it was kind of a disclosure. The water systems needed to notify the states or something like that. Um, with regards to um, use, uh, six year review three, which is where we are now, um, the agency has determined that there are a number of microbial candidates for revision. Um, and those are listed here on this slide. Um, and they uh, are tied to our suite of surface water rules, not all of them. Uh, surface water treatment rule, inner enhanced surface water treatment rule, long-term one surface water treatment rule. The agency also determined that there was a number of DBP parameters, disinfection byproducts, and those are tied to our stage one and stage two disinfectants and, dis and, and disinfection byproduct rules. So we are holding public engagement meetings. We held one back in October. We will have more of those going into 21. And, um, and uh, as you can see on the slide, we're looking at a proposed, um, a proposal uh, uh, in July of 2024 with a final action in September of 27. So it's pretty much out there, but we are start, starting on the ball and on the stick to move on revisions to the suite of surface water rules and the companion disinfection byproducts rules. And, and as many of you know, those were the, the two big chunks of rules that were really, we were really engaged on the risk trade-offs between addressing microbials, but at the same time mitigating impacts from disinfection byproducts. Next slide, please. Trying to get to the end. Um, Got two more slides. Um, 
uh, noteworthy is um, the Americas Water Infrastructure Act of 2018, which um, was probably the most significant amendment to the Safe Drinking Water Act since the 96 amendments. It imposed 30, uh, 30 some odd activities for the agency to move forward on. The ones that are most timely and time critical that affect water utilities is that it amends 1433 of the Safe Drinking Water Act that requires water utilities of a certain size, uh, those greater than 3,300, to um, conduct a revised risk assessment of their water systems. You know, those systems undertook a vulnerability assessment under the 2002 Bioterrorism Act. This um, America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 is now saying that uh, based on your system size, you shall review and revise your risk assessment and revise and, and review your emergency response plan six months after certain statutory dates. So for the large systems, they're listed as they had to comply by March of 31st with a certification that they revised their risk assessment and as well as their ERP six months later. We are, um, and then this, there are different dates for different size systems. Um, I believe most of the systems in the outer Pacifics are in that last category. Um, those systems serving between 3,300 and 50,000. So we've got some time and the agency is working very closely with technical assistance providers and the regulatory agencies on providing training and tools. Um, we talked about UCMR five. This is the, uh, so the uh, American Water Infrastructure Act looked to reduce the population threshold to now require unregulated contaminant monitoring down to the 3,300 population cutoff and this is something new. The Consumer Confidence Report, they are proposing that the agency move forward to require all large systems. Um, and I, I can't remember the system size. Um, it might be greater than 10,000 to do um, twice a year consumer confidence reports. And then the very last one is just kind of sums up our pandemic activities over the course of this past year. And it's unfortunate where we are but the agency uh, really was trying to work with utilities and with our partners, our regulatory agencies to really try and provide as much information as possible and to provide as much resources and assistance to um, utilities. Um, and so this is, um, I'm gonna quickly just say that this is a list of all the things we worked on. The incident action checklist is really um, a, a means by which utilities can use to prepare and respond. Um, the agency really wanted to um, amplify and put on the radar that, that, that uh, water system operators and personnel are essential workers and subsequently then um, wanted to make sure that the governors were um, provided information that Department of Homeland Security and the EPA is recognizing water sector personnel as essential workers for access during the pandemic. We looked at water supply, water sector supply chain issues and tried to uh, work with manufacturers to again, amplify the needs for, uh, for on the part of the water industry for chemicals, uh, worked on workforce protection, providing guidelines and suitable um, uh, uh, perspectives on the protective gear that water utilities would need to have in order to protect them as well as provide them with resources. We did a nationwide survey to assess uh, water sector survey impacts uh, from COVID and again, to educate and inform Congress if indeed there were any resources that could help and provide assistance and, and on and on. Um, and that, with that, I am going to close. Um, so um, Joe, if you could maybe, let's see, let me turn back my screen. Um, and this slides gives you my contact information. If indeed you have questions that I, um, that you can think of that, that uh, I, we don't have time. If I don't have time to get to them, feel free to send them to me and, and I can respond. Um, let me get my video back on and I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Ken. Great, great. Connie, great job, great job. That was a lot of information and thank you for that. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of at, at the point where we should be moving on, but I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for, for some questions, okay? Uh, a number of questions were coming in in the chat and they're really good questions. So I'm just gonna start naming, reading off a few, Connie, and, and if you can, um, uh, please, please help us address them. So uh, the first one, oh, sorry, excuse me. 
Um, the first one here is, um, so will the withdrawal of the 2011 regulatory determination for prochlorite change now that there is a new administration? Um, so we are in that, that very new timeframe. It is what, January the 21st. And so the big T word, transition, 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 transition. Um, I have already seen an executive order issued out that the new incoming administration would like to review a lot of the uh, rulemakings that were put out prior to January 20th. Um, and that includes not only perchlorate, but it also includes the lead and copper rule. So um, we will, we, uh, so great question from Bessie, I guess it was. Yes, Bessie, it, uh, I've already seen um, chatter on my email about re-reviewing the, our perchlorate determination of not to regulate as well as our lead and copper rule revision. Um, I think there was a follow on to her question. There were many issues with the lead and copper rule revision since it was on a fast track with the previous administration. Will US EPA relook at the revisions to address this issue? Or the so issue? I, I will say um, that um, for, uh, for what it's worth, um, our national office did open the opportunity to have region nine as part of the rule writing of the final rule. So where we were given an ability to, to make sense of the rule we did. So where we, 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 our focus was to provide clarity and our focus was to ensure that the water industry um, could move forward in a pathway process. Um, because as you know, the rule is so complicated that um, people interpret aspects of the provisions in very, very different ways. So uh, kind of the short answer to this question is um, the agency is looking at what guidance documents and there are like 30 work groups, I think, between internal and with our regulatory agency to come up with guidance to better clarify and provide um, additional supporting efforts to our utilities in order to comply with this complex rule. So that, that came from Bessie Lee. So thank you, Bessie, for that. Um, moving down, um, a next question from Rick Zimmer. Is for the new lead and copper rule, are water systems directly responsible for sampling, testing, and costs for schools and child care facilities? Uh, these samples incorporated into the system sampling plan or in addition to the distribution plan for the lead and copper rule? Um, so the answer to the first question, are, you, are water systems responsible for the sampling, testing, and cost? The answer is yes. Um, well, uh, these samples incorporated into the system sampling plan um, or addition to the, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Okay, so uh, next is from Jules Mendoza from Guam EPA. For the lead and, I think it's LCR, lead and copper rule monitoring for clarification. When you say reduce monitoring, is it once every three years or has it changed to once every two years? So it is, um, reduced monitoring had been triennial and I, I don't know if they've kept that throughout the new rule. Um, but you know, I think the clarifying aspect on this one is the trigger level and not being able to go to reduced monitoring. So um, it, it may not get to, Julie, your question specifically, Jules, but um, that is a huge, huge um, change, is not allowing for reduced triennial if you exceed the trigger level. You know, I apologize. I, I jumped over Ms. Camacho. Let me go back. Um, uh, Ms. Camacho's question came in with the new tiers. Do we need to start again to determine our tier or just continue at our current status? It question. is likely that most water systems will have to go back and, and do standard monitoring to do their tiers in coupled with their materials inventory. Okay, so this next question comes from uh, Emmanuel John Uggen. Uh, this gives a lot of background information, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna just jump ahead. Uh, he's got a couple of questions here at the bottom. Um, I guess uh, addressing PFAS and what, how do you how do you address non-point source pollution? What are the resources for the suggested or approved mitigation measures to reduce already existing PFAS and groundwater environment, as it is not specific, specifically attributed to a point source? And do you have any online resources uh, available at US EPA? Great question. Um, I, I have a, that's one that um, who's asking the question. Emmanuel, can you and I get together on this one? Because I don't have. Um, 
um, an answer for that one on non-point source right now. I, I totally, I, I think we are from an agency standpoint, um, you know, we started in the drinking water arena where you've got point sources. Non-point sources has always opened kind of a bigger can of dialogue engagement in terms of who do you engage and how and what types of authorities can we bring to the table to try and arrest this? So um, we should probably speak further. Okay, let's go and, ahead. And, okay. No, go ahead. Please finish. No, no, Ken. It's only because um, I'm probably, uh, you know, I, I would probably bring other colleagues in on this discussion. Um, can I suggest then, uh, Emmanuel, John, if, if you're there, you can you can uh, email our group and we'll put you in contact with Connie to get a, a specific um, a answer to your question and, and move this forward for you. So you can, if you want to put your email, uh, PM your email to myself or, or, or anyone in our, in the, uh, in the, um, in our group, we can send that along to the Connie to get you a specific answer. So great. You know, Ken, the other option too, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, there might be others in the audience that might be interested in this answer. So it's, you know, at some point in time, you know, I want to make sure that we come full circle back so other folks can can okay. hear, hear our answer Maybe as well. What we can do is if there's dialogue, we can share it with the uh, with this group. Um, I'll talk to okay. our group. See if okay. Some, or I'm sure there is a way. We have these the communication. So. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Um, one last question here, and maybe there's going to be more that show up, but for the new PFAS regs, uh, when will sampling and reporting need to start? That's from Ms. Camacho. Uh, for the new new PFAS regs. Um, so, um, <laughs> so moving forward, you know, it takes uh, 24 months to develop a proposed MCL and 18 months to finalize it. So Theron of itself is uh, three and a half years. Is that right? Two years. Yeah, three. Th uh, to three and a half years. Then once we put out, once we put out a regulation, it doesn't become effective right away. There's usually a two to three year time frame. So if we, if you look now, and we made a determination today, in January 21st, 2021, we're talking three and a half years out before we have a final ruling on PFO and PFOS. And then, and then we would add an additional two years to give time for laboratories to come up with a method, for utilities to come up to speed on what they have to do, to the, for the states to come up to speed, for our data tracking systems to be in place. Um, so we are looking at five plus years out. Does that make sense? Sounds like it does. Yeah. Uh, two more questions came in. So I think we'll go ahead and continue moving on this track here. Uh, we got Maria Lewis, so with systems with no, um, LSLs ha ha still have to redo standardized monitoring. I think I can't remember, uh, lower. Oh, lead service line. Okay. So if you don't have lead service lines, would you have to redo standard? Probably not. You know, again, um, you know, the, the, the premise for this lead and copper rule revisions is really for targeted at reducing lead exposure from utilities with lead service lines. You know, I think there was a lot of interest from our Pacific Southwest region, particularly California, who tried to champion headquarters and say, can't we have a companion regulation that focused on non-lead service line <laughs> communities? Um, so I think part of our job in region nine in working with our Pacific Southwest states, regions, tribes is to work the rule and to find areas of the rule that would be particularly important for communities and utilities that lack lead service lines in their inventory. So we will work with you and hopefully we'll uh, be able to kind of inform any guidance document that comes out. Well, it looks like this discussion has spread a lot of back and forth. This is good. This is really good stuff here. Um, I want to also apologize. I think I might be mispronouncing your name, Corinne. Corinne oh, right? It's Corinne. Yeah, it's okay. okay thank you. Um, I also want to acknowledge we have Senator Sabrina Sa uh, on Salas on the line. Um, so thank you. I think there's a question from her. How can interim action levels for PFAS be implemented? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, interim action levels. I'm sorry, what was that? How can interim action levels for PFAS uh, contaminants be implemented? Well, you know, again, um, uh, it's non-regulated. There, in, any any interim numbers like interim guidelines, recommendations, they're there to inform the dialogue. And the dialogue is important because you have the community, you have the respondent, you have the uh, impacted, you have the facility. So a lot, you know, unless it's a final rulemaking where there is authorities for which to enforce, 
it's 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 really more to inform the dialogue with 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 based on science and it, and the science is we've developed interim recommendations because we have science to back up the numbers in in terms of cleanup levels in terms of uh, PRGs, uh, goals, so remediation goals, it's to inform the dialogue and discussion so that we can come to terms. Um, but until, as, as we all hope for, and I, and I wish the agency can move a little faster, but you know, we are an agency and things kind of turn a little slow. Um, uh, all we can do is put out what we know in a timely manner with regards to the science and the risk assessments and the risk health information that we have to inform dialogue and discussions between all parties. Wonderful. Well, yeah, big ships do take a little bit quicker, slower to turn. <laughs> um, you know, there's a few more questions, but in the interest of time, I want to uh, keep our keep our going. I think Brian Bearden was mentioning in the chat that he might be touching on this very topic on, on the next um, presentation. So, um, Corinne, thank you again. Any last uh, closing remarks before we move on? No, uh, this was, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, feel free to email me if you have questions and um, I look forward to the rest of your program. All right.